All right. So this describes what I said I called uh, variational annealing. It's there in red. That doesn't make it special, except it's easy to find. So what you want to do is calculate the minimum of that action, the minima of the action, as a function of RF. And I'm going to plot for you what that actually looks like. So this is a simple neuron model. This is the model with sodium channels, potassium channels, and a fancy fudge factor that Hodgkin and Huxley threw in there that are called leak channels. That means there's a little bit more in there that we don't really know much about. It's a problem with four dimensions and 19 parameters, and we get one measurement. Here are the equations of motion. These are the Hodgkin-Huxley equations that Dan referred to. It's current conservation, conductances that depend on voltage through functions that satisfy this differential equation that's driven by voltage. And then there's some functions that are in there to represent these functions. And these functions, I'm not going to discuss them. They're standard. And they're, they're structured so that when you put a current into this model neuron, it spikes. And then it spikes again and does interesting things. Using this model, discretized in time, well, here's an example. That we put this current, which we made up, into that neuron, which we made up, and that's the voltage as a function of time. I'm not going to dwell on that. But this is what the calculation gives you. Down here, this is the logarithm of RF. So down here, RF is small. It's not literally zero. This is not minus infinity. But down here, there are many minima, all compacted into that. As you increase RF so that the model becomes more and more precise, what you find is that the action becomes independent of RF. And there is exactly one minimum left. It's not only the global minimum, it's the only minimum. And you can check that if the action becomes independent of RF, the only term that matters is the measurement error term. The measurement error term, by definition, is, comes from a Gaussian. So x minus y is distributed as a Gaussian. x minus y squared is distributed as chi squared. You can calculate the expected value of that, and that's the green line. So the calculation is totally consistent. We found the minimum that is consistent with the underlying action. Um, I'm going to, th th there's no new information here. Somebody was talking to me about parameters in models. You want to estimate the parameters in the model. We know what they are. This is a twin experiment. Here are the estimated parameters in the second column. They're not perfect, but they're awfully good. Here's the Lorentz 96 model. Uh, again, we do twin experiments. And uh, this was an 11-dimensional model. I think uh, Sasha Sherman in the back here actually did the calculations. And here's what happens. Suppose you take the 11-dimensional model and you make two measurements. You can see from that that the action levels behave like that. Many of them become independent of the accuracy of the model, but there's no action level that is significantly smaller than any other. There are lots of minima, and they're all kind of close together. And what Laplace would say is you have to sum up the contributions of all of these probability maxima or action minima. What if you make four measurements instead of two? What you find is that one of the action levels comes down to the one that's consistent with being the lowest. There is now a gap, and the probability distribution goes exponentially in the value of the action level. This is the logarithm of the action level. It's exponential in the action level. This contribution is exponentially larger than this contribution to that integral. And that's what you want. So you can do a really good approximation to the integral with four measurements. Want more measurements? Well, no problem. Make five measurements. There are only two action levels. Make six measurements. There's only one. 
This gives you a quantitative criterion given data and a model whether or not your path determined by whatever method you want will give you an accurate estimate of moments of the probability distribution that you're after, including the expected value of the state variables, temperature, pressure, whatever you. Here's a neurobiological example. My neurons are not either as beautiful or as irregular as the ones that are in Dan's lab. That's mine. Here's differential equation. It is just as Dan described. It has a current for sodium entering and leaving the cell. It has a current for potassium. And it has a uh, fudge factor. And it has a current that we, by hand, put into the neuron to drive it into oscillations. If that sounds familiar, that's what we did to the transistor. All right, I said all of these things, and I will. That's Dan's picture. Here is an example of an experiment from Dan's lab. On top here is the current as a function of time. The units are down here. Ne never mind what they are, but this is uh, about uh, um, a second, 1,000 milliseconds, two seconds. This is the response of the neuron. You may ask, how did we choose this current to put into the neuron? Almost all neurobiology labs put in a current and then a step to a slightly different current and then a step back to another current. This kind of current, so there's some steps in that current. This kind of current has amplitudes that drive the neuron through its entire dynamical range with a single current. The current lasts long enough so that if there is a long time constant in the response of the actual neuron, it sees it. And there's one other physical criterion having to do with the structure of the cell membrane that it matches. Oops. Um, why did it? Hmm. OK. Here's. Uh, uh, a different neuron, again, from Dan's lab. This is the current that we use there. This is the voltage response. Here is the data. This is the estimation made in the window in which we're making observations. What we did is we went through the whole procedure that I described. We found the optimal path, voltage, uh, currents and so forth through the neuron, you can see that in the estimation window, the match with the data, which is in black, not surprising uh, that it's so good. And here is the prediction associated with that model. We have no way of measuring most of the dynamical variables in that neuron. They govern the rate at which sodium and potassium pass through the cell wall. We don't know what that is. The only verification that the model has satisfied some of the structure of the actual neuron is in the quality of these predictions. To me, these predictions tell you that we're not done. We missed something in the model. And that message is to go back, add additional aspects to the dynamics of the model to satisfy what's going on outside the region of these spikes. All right. That's a subject that doesn't have any generality. It has to do with knowledge of, and Dan talked about much of it uh, today, knowledge of the neurons in the system that you're talking about. This is another example, uh, actually, yes, uh, of the same kind of thing. I'm repeating myself to show that it's not a, a single time we have, we have a library of, I'm, I'm going to use round numbers, order of 100 different neurons with order of 50 or 70 different measurements on each one of them. Uh, some of them fail this that because, as Dan pointed out, a neuron that uh, doesn't do anything is dead. And after you stick these neurons and do experiments on them, like injecting current for a couple hours, they tend to die. So this, 
the ones that are successful are in the region in which they're still alive and acting in response to your current. Now I have two more topics to talk about. And is it time for another break? All right, what time? I can't read quite the time. 18, all right, we'll start promptly at half past the hour, okay? Time for a break.